Good afternoon and welcome to today's speaker series, the Dean Speaker Series, co-sponsored by the Center for Responsible Businesses Peterson Speaker Series. I am very excited to introduce today's guest, a leader who truly embodies our defining leadership principles, Chip Berg, President and CEO of Levi Strauss and Company. Chip joined Levi's in 2011 and pledged to make sustainability a primary emphasis for the company. Their stated mission to not just make great clothes, but to make great clothes in a sustainable way has been at the forefront of a number of significant sustainability initiatives implemented in this past decade. In March, 2019, under CHIP's leadership, Levi successfully launched an IPO on the New York Stock Exchange after the company reported 2018 results of 13.9% year-on-year growth in global revenue. Levi's products are sold today in more than 110 countries through a combination of chain retailers, department stores, and online sites. Prior to joining Levi's in September 2011, Chip had a 28-year career at Procter & Gamble, where he oversaw all aspects of branding innovation and key investment decisions, notably leading the global expansion of Gillette Fusion to more than 80 new markets. In April 2019, Chip was named one of the top 20 world's greatest leaders by Fortune magazine, and he has been widely recognized for his values-driven leadership. Today's conversation will be led by four Haas students who in just a moment will introduce themselves. Robert Strand, our executive director of the Haas Center for Responsible Business will lead the audience Q&A. On behalf of all of us here at Berkeley Haas, thank you, Chip for taking time out of what I know is an incredibly busy schedule to share your insights with us today. I'd like to start the conversation with a question that I've been posing myself for the last several months. So leading in a crisis is something that we teach in our classes. We never imagined that this pandemic would give us a unique kind of real-time case study to explore how to lead in a crisis. So I'm really curious as a business leader, have you shifted the way you lead during this crisis? Are there certain key attributes or talents that you find yourself leaning into as you respond to this crazy uncertain world? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, first of all, Anne, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. As, as I said um, right before we went live, my only regret is that we can't do it in person because um, I love these kind of opportunities and I really do appreciate and I'm looking forward to the conversation over the next hour. Um, the short answer is yes, and I will get to kind of what I've leaned into uh, predominantly through this you know, once in a lifetime kind of experience that we're all going through. But I would say that it's it's more than one crisis that we're living through. We're living through multiple crises all at the same time and, and navigating all of them. Uh, and there's an interconnectedness between these crises. So you've got obviously the health crisis or the global pandemic that has us all zooming into this meeting right now. You have the economic fallout from that crisis. You know, there are still 10 million Americans less employed or not employed today that were employed before the pandemic. And then you have the, the racial and social justice crises, which have also emerged. And the, the health crisis has really shined a spotlight on the structural racism that exists in this country and, and the critical need for us to address some of these issues around equality. And, um, and all of this wrapped up um, you know, in, a, in a way that has us all experiencing life in a very, very different way. Um, you know, we're all zooming in from different parts of the globe right now, instead of being together in a classroom or an auditorium and, and being able to share you know, 
directly with one another. And, and the stress that's associated with that, especially, you know, young parents who are trying to manage two or three kids zooming into school remotely. I mean, it's just, that's another crisis on top of it. And the potential impact that this could have predominantly on women is a big concern of mine as well, because a lot of this still falls on the woman as the, as the primary driver of getting the kids to school. And, um, and so you have multiple crises happening at the same time. From a business standpoint, I would say that um, our focus has been, you know, we had tremendous momentum and a lot of success leading up to this fiscal year. As you said, we took the company public. The, the whole Levi's story over the last nine years has been a turnaround story. We underperformed for more than a decade and we've turned the company around. Levi's is back. It's a hot brand. We're number one around the world. Um, we had a couple of years of double digit growth leading to the IPO. And even in our first quarter of this past fiscal year, which for us is December, January, and February, we reported mid single digit levels of growth. And, and that was with a little bit of COVID impact in Asia. And then the hammer fell and we, you know, second quarter, our doors were closed for 10 of the 13 weeks of the quarter and our revenues were down 67%. And I can honestly say I've never had to report revenue results that bad. And uh, we lost over $200 million of profit that quarter. Um, but when the pandemic really hit us, we made a commitment that we were gonna emerge from the pandemic stronger. We might be a smaller company, we will be a smaller company because of the impact that, that this is having on our business, but we will emerge from it stronger. Our brands will be stronger. We will grow share through this and we will change the shape of our P&L so that when our business does return to pre-COVID levels, which it will, we will be more profitable as a company. So, so we're really focused on that from a business standpoint, but from a leadership standpoint, I would say the big pivot for me has been to kind of um, really amp up my empathy muscles. I like to think I'm a pretty empathetic guy to begin with. I'm, I'm very approachable. I'm really reasonably down to earth. Um, you know, I miss being in the office and having hallway conversations or riding up in the elevator with folks and just having those spont spontaneous moments. But, um, you know, this crisis really has created opportunities for me to listen more and really empathize with the unique situations that people find themselves in and, and really trying to think through how to solve some of these issues for us as a company, for us as an organization, but even more broadly, the impact that we can make here in society. So uh, after the George Floyd murder, um, you know, I basically went into listening mode with a number of our black leaders and, um, and it led to one of probably the most, um, yeah, I, I would call it one of the most difficult moments of my nine years in this company. And that is recognizing and, and, and declaring publicly that we've not made the progress we need to make in building a diverse and inclusive organization. And when I listened to some of the black leaders tell me about their experience inside the company and some of the microaggressions that they deal with almost on a daily basis. I mean, set aside living in San Francisco, which is hard enough just looking at inside our own four walls and, and some of the issues that we have as a company, I feel like I've failed in that area. And I think part of being a good leader is to step up and to say, there are places where I could have done better. And this is certainly one. Um, you know, when I joined the company, diversity and inclusion was really low on my list. The house was on fire. We needed to fix the house. And I thought the two were separate. And I look back on it now and I realize if we had addressed our diversity and inclusion issues really head on hard in the very early days, we'd be a better company today. We're a pretty good company right now, but we'd be a better company because I really do believe that diverse organizations will outcompete homogenous ones every single day. 
you know, I talked about women at home and, and the challenges that, um, you know, dual income uh, couples with kids, what they're dealing with, you know, especially if they're living in San Francisco in a 900 square foot apartment with two kids zooming into school and trying to do school remotely, it's a challenge. And then they've got a boss who's expecting them to be on, you know, wall to wall video conferences all, all day. And, and I've really had to step in and, and demand of leaders that they be empathetic to the unique situations that each one of their employees is facing. Um, you, we cannot project how we're dealing with the pandemic on our own basis and expect that all of our employees are experiencing it the same way. Everybody has unique and different circumstances. Um, you know, again, I went into listening mode with a lot of our employees at all levels to understand how is the, how is the pandemic impacting them? And I, I literally have had employees tell me that they, they've become depressed, that they've had to seek clinical help for depression. I've had, uh, we've had an, a, an employee uh, leave the company. She was a single mom with three kids, two kids zooming to school and a toddler. And she said, I, you know, I'm failing as a mom, I'm failing at work, something's got to give and that's an easy choice. And so that, you know, that, that's been the challenge as a leader. And we talk about the importance of stakeholder management. One of the most important stakeholders I believe I've got is our team, the people of this company. They are what has turned the company around. That's that's the team that has made this company what it is again. And, and, and that has, has been really, really hard too. Um, I guess the last thing I would say, and, and then we can move on, I feel like I'm rambling here a little bit, but there's, there's a lot to unpack in that question. Um, you know, the hardest decision I had to make during this pandemic was right in that second quarter when we saw our business falling off of a cliff. We're about a six billion going into this year. We our forecast or our plan for the year was to be a little bit more than six billion dollars in sales. And there's a little bit of seasonality, but if you just straight line it, an average quarter is about one and a half billion dollars in sales. That second quarter, we did less than a half a billion dollars in sales. We lost a billion dollars off of the top line in one quarter, and we had no idea how bad, how long, we still don't really know how long is this gonna continue. So I, we had a, an organization built to support a $6 billion business. And it was pretty clear to me that we were gonna wind up somewhere pretty far south of five. And we had to adjust our cost structure. And that resulted in us announcing on that same second quarter call that we were laying off 700 people. And that was maybe one of the hardest decisions I've ever had to make in my career. And we've been through a restructure once before, shortly after I joined, we needed to do it then. This time was a lot different because the business was healthy. And if it weren't for this act of God, then the pandemic and the impact that that had on our business, we would never have had to do this. But what made it really, really tough is I saw the list of people who we were letting go and a lot of them had been with the company and had contributed to the turnaround. And so these were really talented contributors that we had to let go because our back was against the wall. And I, I, it was still the right thing to do because I have to think about, you know, we've been around for 168 years. I had to think about the next 168 years. So it was the right thing to do, but man, was it hard. And so Having that empathy muscle and really being willing to listen and, and put yourself in another person's shoe, shoes to, to understand what they're dealing with at that moment, um, you know, in the midst of all of these combined crises together has been probably the most important thing that I've, I've had to really exercise during this period of time. Thank you so much for that, Chip. That, that was really powerful. Uh, response. And now um, we're going to turn to Olivia. 
Thank you so much, sir, for being here with us tonight, uh, albeit virtually. Um, my name is Olivia Wastemies, and I am a first year full-time MBA student at Haas. Um, and my question is a, a bit of a two-part question. Um, I would love to know uh, a little bit more about the rationale behind the decision for Levi's to go public in 2019 after over a century of, of operating as a private company. Um, and, and my follow-up to that is, do you have any concerns about how earnings pressure and the short-termism that comes along with it might impact Levi's ability to continue to make values-led decisions in the future? Um, okay, great questions. Uh, and I get asked this a lot, as you can imagine. Um, so the rationale on doing the IPO was, was fairly straightforward um, and, and I'll take you through it. We, we actually were public once before, small known fact, for uh, about a decade or so in the 70s. And then the company did what at the time was the largest LBO in the history of Wall Street and took the company private again. And then they did a second LBO uh, in the mid nineties to buy out um, half of the family and consolidate the ownership and um, took on a ton of debt right at a time when the economy was going into the tank and retailers were consolidating, our wholesale customers were consolidating and we lost our largest wholesale customer. And that contributed to this 10 year fall off of a cliff. In 1996, the company was $7 billion in sales. We went from $7 billion to $4 billion in about five years. And you all are business school students. You know that's going the wrong direction, right? So, And then we just kind of bumped along for a number of years. But so the rationale was as follows. Um, and, and to be clear, we it's not like we really needed the cash. We had a really strong balance sheet at that point in time. This was really about um, liquidity for our shareholders, which were all family members, descendants of Levi Strauss himself. Uh, but when we talk about the family and our family shareholders, you know, this is, it's, it's not like Facebook where it's Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, there are over a hundred family members and when you add up their trusts and everything else, almost 200 shareholders that hold stock in Levi's before we went public. And you play that out another generation or two generations or three generations, and we would get to such fragmented ownership that it would be almost impossible to govern a company like that. And so that was, that was one consideration. Um, and, and within that, there were family members who wanted liquidity and um, wanted to be able to diversify their portfolio. Um, a lot of pride in Levi's but they wanted to be able to diversify. And as a privately held company with a shareholder agreement in place, the only way that they could get liquidity is to sell their shares to another family member. And nobody wanted to be that person. And so, you know, obviously the, the best way to get liquidity is to have a publicly traded vehicle. So, so that became another supporting reason to go public. Um, the third reason was, you know, you, you want to go public when you've got a good story to tell. And we had an amazing story to tell because here we've got, you know, this company that at the time was 165 or 166 years old. Um, we hit a real bad spot in the early 2000s. New CEO comes in, builds a new management team, turns the business around, a couple of years of double digit growth, uh, you know, and, and you know, promising kind of ongoing mid single digit levels of growth with profitable growth to go with that great shareholder return results in the past. And a guy who said, I'm willing to stick around for a few more years. And you're, you're not going to get those kind of, you know, it's like the moon and the stars all need to line up at the same time. So when you put the, the shareholder need for liquidity, this kind of Eventually, it's almost inevitable. You're going to have to do something from a governance standpoint anyway. Business results and a management team that delivered those results saying we're willing to stick around for a while longer. And so that was the rationale for why we went. And a lot of work went into it, obviously, you know, needing to make sure that we still, um, you know, really take care of our, our family shareholders. We went dual class. 
So the family has 10 votes for every share of stock that they own. Public investors only get one vote. So the family still has significant voting control over the company. And that's a really good thing. When we did the roadshow, we told investors, think of the family as long-term shareholders. That's what they are. They're most invested in making sure that this, conti this, this company continues to be successful and continues to operate the way we've always operated, values led. So, which gets to the second question or second part of your question. When we did our roadshow, so part of the whole IPO process is companies go out and they meet with prospective investors and you know, kind of give their pitch and then get into a QA. and a And you get, it's, it's uh, eight or nine or 10 days of just wall-to-wall -wall meetings facing the firing squad and um, just getting asked lots of hard questions by investors. But we made it really, really clear during our IPO that what got us to where we are is being a values-led company. And by you know, doubling down on the things that make us who we are, we talked about our values, we talk about the investments that we've made in sustainability, we talk about some of the innovation that's come out of sustainability, and, and we basically, you know, I, I even, I talked about the stand that we took on ending gun violence in this country, you know, a pretty polarizing place to be. And I said, if, if you don't have the appetite for that, we're not your kind of stock. Don't invest in us. And I do think, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not worried, at least as long as I'm CEO, I'm not worried about us ever compromising the long term for the short term. We will continue to run this company as a values-led company. I actually believe it's good for business. I believe that over time, and, and we're seeing this happen with the pandemic, consumers are getting more and more concerned about sustainability, that over time, these positions that we've taken as a company, history will prove us to be on the right side on every single one of these things, as has been the case for this company for generations. And, and that's kind of the, the bar that I set when we, when, we, when we make the decisions that we make is, will history prove us to be on the right side of the issue over time? And, and I'm convinced that of all the stands and all the things that we stand for, that we've taken positions on, that we've invested in, history is going to prove us right. And, and look at the business results. They've been pretty good the last 10 years. So, and I think they'll continue to be good setting aside the impact of the pandemic. So uh, maybe the next question. Yeah, I'll be asking the next question. Um, so I chip, my name is Justin Hoganauer and I'm a third year junior at Berkeley Haas. And so I'm in the undergraduate uh, business program. Oftentimes as an undergraduate student at Haas and a cadet in Berkeley's Air Force ROTC program, I hear a lot about organizational culture at Haas, our institutional culture is really rooted in our defining leadership principles. And these core values are clearly apparent, whether it might be office hours with faculty member or in the classroom with other students. And so to my question, how do you promote Levi's values, which you've spoken to throughout the organization as a CEO? And how do you make these values relevant in the long run? Um, and if you would talk to your military experience as well, I'd be happy to share that perspective. Okay, um, so first of all, as, as I said before we hopped on live, congratulations on uh, your decision to, you know, do a tour of duty to serve our country. Um, I, I did the same and uh, I also went through ROTC. I was in a different, I was, I was in the Army, uh, Army ROTC, but um, it, it, in many ways it made me who I am today. It really shaped me as a leader um, I learned most of my leadership lessons in the military. Actually, if you look me up on LinkedIn, I've got a posting, the 10 lessons I learned in the military, which I wrote back in like 1990 or something. Um, and they're still relevant today. Um, but, uh, you know, as a company, um, we talk about our four values of empathy, originality, integrity, and courage as, as, something that is really, really near and dear to us. And that, um, that these, are, these are what we expect of each other. Um, it's a standard that we hold ourselves to, and it ladders up to what we try to do 
as a company, which is to make an outsized impact on this world. Um, we talk about profits through principles. Um, and we, we do have this virtual spiral that starts with our values and our commitment to doing the right thing. And I like to talk about doing the, the harder right over the easier wrong. And, and that that feeds into the successes of our business, our ability to connect with consumers, and, and, and that just drives that virtual si spiral, you know, uh, all the way. Um, you know, how, how do I drive it um, is, is really two things. One, where and how I spend my time. Um, you know, one of the things that I learned shortly after I became CEO is everybody knows what I'm doing. And, uh, and where I spend my time, you know, what meetings I, I call, what agenda items I have drive focus inside the company. And it, and it sends a signal to what's important, um, where and how we make investments um, uh, sends a signal. So an example of that, very early uh, as the new CEO here, um, we made a decision to to invest in moving our innovation center, which was in Chorlu, Turkey, which is halfway around the world. It's literally a planes, trains, and automobiles kind of trip to get there. You fly into Istanbul and then you get in a car and drive for two and a half hours. And you know, product development and innovation in the apparel industry, it's very tactile and it's iterative. And you know, you need to, you're constantly tweaking patterns and things like that. And all of our designers and most of our merchants are sitting in San Francisco, yet our innovation center is over in Turkey. And so I made the decision to invest, it was just a couple of million dollars, but it was for us at the time, you know, we were highly levered. We had $2 billion of debt on our balance sheet. It was, it was a big bet, but it was to send the signal about the importance of innovation and importantly, innovation around sustainability. And you know what I what I said at the time was here we are we're sitting in San Francisco, which at that point in time I used to talk about it as the northern tip of Silicon Valley. Now it's the heart of Silicon Valley, and and you know we have access to all these brilliant, um, creative people in the valley, but we can't tap into it because our innovation center is all the way in in Turkey. So we made the small investment, I think it was less than $5 million, moved this innovation center here, really focused on innovation and sustainability. Um, so more sustainable chemistry, waterless innovations, things that help planet earth. Um, and we started attracting attention from other innovators in the Valley. And we wound up doing a project with Google so we actually, we launched one of the very first wearable pieces of apparel. It was a trucker jacket where you could control your iPhone with the swipe of your sleeve. You know, that wouldn't have happened if our innovation center was still over in Turkey. So, um, you know, where and how I spend my time, um, what things we decide to stand up for sends a very, very strong signal. So two more examples. Um, when our now exiting president was the new president, many of you will remember that within the first week, he put this immigration ban in place and basically banned immigration from seven Muslim countries. We immediately took a position on that, but that was wrong. And, um, you know, we were joined by a bunch of other companies. The headline the next day, was Apple, Facebook, Google, and Levi's stand up against the immigration ban. Those other three have like trillion dollar market caps. We've got like $7 billion on a good day right now. And, you know, but, but we punch way above our weight because we've got this consistent track record of not being afraid to speak up on something, um, you know, Another one is, you know, after the George Floyd murder, we obviously, you know, took a very strong stand then. But uh, when we, when I had this conversation, which I re referred to earlier internally, we realized we needed to take some really aggressive and publicly visible action. 
Um, so we stepped up, we published our diversity data totally transparently, um, which in the aggregate in the US is okay, but when you strip out our retail business and our distribution centers in corporate headquarters, our diversity numbers are terrible. And we owned it, I owned it. It's a problem, we gotta fix it. And so being transparent and communicating, not just the fact that we've got an issue, but then we had a multi-step action plan that we put into place and, um, and we we're already starting to fulfill some of those some of those action steps. So we're very, very committed to make progress. It's a big priority of mine. It's got to be driven from the top. And, you know, that sent a really strong signal. So where and how I spend my time, where and how I invest and the things that I use the platform. This is not about Chip Berg. This is about the platform of the CEO of Levi Strauss and Company, which is a very powerful platform. How I use that platform and what I choose to speak out on, um, which obviously is a, is a team sport internally, we can talk about that a little bit, but um, that, that, you know, that is how you build culture over time. And it sends a signal what's important. And, and that's kind of how we've done it over the last couple of years. Yeah, thank you for that insightful answer. And now sure. I'll pass it over to Nicole for the next question. Thanks, Justin. And Chip, thank you so much for being here. My name is Nicole Austin Thomas. I'm a second year MBA student at Haas. My question is a bit more zoomed in and actually really dovetails nicely into your definition of personal platform. Like many others, I'll be graduating into an uncertain and politically charged world entering a large ingrained company and um, as an individual con contributor. And I'd love to hear more about your perspective on how we can best chart a path to affect change. Awesome question. And it's one of the things I, that I love about the Haas School is um, the, the, the graduates of that school leave the school with this sense of burning purpose to make a difference in the world. And, um, and, and I think it is a huge differentiator for the school. And you know, so kudos to everybody who is involved in shaping that. And it's, it's clear, you know, knowing many Haas graduates, and we've got a bunch who work at the company um, that, that they've been shaped by the, the experience at Haas. So um, you know, the first thing I would say, and this one sounds like it's already water under the bridge for you, but um, is choose where you join very, very carefully. Um, you know, what I, I, I've been really, really lucky if you think about it, since the time I graduated from college, which was now 41 years ago, um, uh, I've only worked at three places. I've worked at, in the US Army, which has been around for about 250 years, Procter & Gamble, which has been around for about 185 years, and Levi Strauss, which has been around for coming up on 169 years. And, um, you know, I would say they're not really companies, they're institutions. And one of the things that uh, I think differentiates those institutions from others is this deep sense of values and purpose. And in fact, when I decided to leave PG and come join Levi's, one of the most important things on my list of consideration was the values of the company because I knew at PNG, PNG was invested in my success individually. Um, they they career pathed me, you know, and I wound up running PNG's second largest business, second most profitable business, a huge global brand, the, the Gillette business. After PNG spent fifty seven billion dollars buying it, and um, you know, one of the things I knew about that company was that it was always committed to doing the right thing. That's, you know, at the end of the day, that was the value system of that company. And when I realized that that's really part of the, the, the thread that runs through Levi Strauss and that the company really does firmly believe that our business results are intricately uh, married to our values, that you can't have the business results without the values. That, that this was a place for me. And in fact, 
when I joined the company, I actually believed that one way to get the company out of the hole that it was in was to double down on the values, to really start talking about our values and to begin, uh, you know, through where I spent my time and where I communicated and the platforms and the investments that we made to double down on our, on our values. And so, <clears throat> so the first piece of advice I would give is choose where you join very, very carefully. And, you know, make sure that wherever you're going, that the values of that firm, that company, that organization are very, very closely aligned to your own. And that you know that you feel like you will be empowered to make a difference. Everybody, I started at the bottom of the ladder at PNG. In fact, they don't even have the title that I had when I joined the company anymore. They eliminated it. I started as a brand assistant. They don't even have brand assistants anymore. You start as an assistant brand manager today. I had to work for eighteen months to get to assistant brand manager, and. Um, and, and um, but I would also say, bring your true authentic self to work every single day. Do not compromise on that. And, and if it turns out that it's not gonna work out at that place, then it wasn't meant to be because you don't wanna be somebody that you're not, right? And so be your true authentic self, don't be afraid to, to, to stand up for what you think is right internally. Don't be afraid to walk away from something that you think is wrong. Don't be afraid to have that conversation with your manager or, or your boss if something is done you know, in a way that you're, you, you find challenging. And don't be afraid to walk away if, if it doesn't match with your personal value system. Um, and it takes a ton of courage to do that. And, um, but at the end of the day, I think nothing is worse than compromising who you are to fit in. And that, and that's, for me, I, I say that knowing that I have people in my company that had to do that. And that's why I am so committed to fixing it because, um, you know, life is too short. And, and by being your true authentic self, you will be more successful. You will be happier. Um, you will be more fulfilled. And you will make a bigger difference. So don't make that trade-off where you, you feel like you have to compromise who you are to be someone else, to fit in, to belong. And, and you're better off trying to, to address the issues and trying to get it righted. And if, and if you can't, then walk away and find some place where your values will be, um, you know, will be a good match with the values of the company. And it, you know, it's easy for me to say it. I'm at the tail end of my career and, you know, I'm a CEO and that sounds really, really easy. It's hard. I know it's hard, but which is worse, being happy or being miserable, right? And if you have to compromise who you are and give in on the things that are important to you to, to find success at whatever company you're going to, but you're not happy because you know you're making compromises, it's not worth it. And, and it's a big world out there. And, and I think what's, again, what's so inspiring about, you know, the students at Haas is everyone's committed to making a difference in this world. A lot of you chose to go to Haas because you know it's going to supercharge your superpowers there. Use those superpowers. Don't let them go to waste. Next question. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, Sarah Hilmer here. I'm an evening and weekend MBA student in my uh, final year. I was going to ask you all about when you decide to take a stance on an issue, but I've been so inspired by what you've already shared around really leveraging your values and not being afraid to really, um, you know, tell it to your shareholders like it is. So I'm, I'm going to pivot my question a bit and ask about um, who, who is blocking you from making the right decision? Are there any blockers? Uh, you know, how, how are you working with policymakers and employees and what do you do if there's a case where maybe your values aren't aligned with, with their values? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, I, I am uh, really blessed uh, with a great team around me, um, you know, especially when it comes to policy matters, um, uh, 
communication matters. Uh, I've got really a, a super strong team. And we, have, we do have debates about things, you know, whether we go public or not go public on things and, and, uh, and, and where and how do we take a stand. Um, I'm also lucky, I, I think I've probably earned this with nine years of results, but I've got a great relationship with the board. Um, I, I feel like I have full support of the board um, and I feel like I have, you know, very strong shareholder support, especially from the family members. Um, I, I've done well for them. And, and uh, but, you know, I, I think they also really appreciate how I continue to drive the company and the company's values. So, you know, I've, I've got kind of the moon and stars all lining up there to help me. Um, but, you know, at the, at the, at the same time, uh, you know, if you stand for everything, you stand for nothing. So we do have to pick our spots, right? We can't weigh in on everything. And there are some things where it's worth weighing in on, and there are some where it's clear that it's not. And then there are some that are tweeners, and those become tough conversations. But um, we, we do have a framework now that, you know, I've worked with the board of directors so that I have a certain amount of flexibility to weigh in on something without needing to go check with everybody, okay? So the framework is pretty simple. It's basically three big pillars, civic engagement. So under that right now, we've got, um, you know, voting here in the United States is a big one and we played a really significant role. I'm not taking credit for the voter turnout, but we had almost 2000 companies sign up to give employees time off to vote on election day. Mm -hmm. And it, it represented more than 10 million employees. So voting falls into this pillar um, and ending gun violence prevent or ending gun violence in this country falls under that pillar. The second big pillar is equality. And this is something this company has stood for for a really long time. Um, and, you know, there are several bullet points underneath that that includes um, programs for racial justice, um, gender equality, LGBTQ equality, um, refugee programs, um, immigration rights falls under this too. So, you know, it's kind of a big uh, human rights almost kind of uh, pillar, but wrapped around this notion of equality. And that's why, you know, when I mentioned um, when Trump put the immigration ban in place, I didn't make a single phone call to the board. We just went and said, this is wrong. We're taking a stand against this. We signed an amicus brief. I mean, we, we were all in on, on you know, taking a very strong position on this because it's a fundamental human right. And just because somebody happens to be Muslim, you can't close your borders to them, we felt. Um, and then the third big pillar for us is in the area of sustainability, which is, um, you know, so water, chemicals, um, uh, uh, now circular economy becoming a bigger and bigger thing. Uh, and, and we can talk about that. Um, those are all pre-established, predefined. If there's an issue and it falls into one of those buckets, we can go. And, and as I said, there are some where it's a clear, let's do this. There are some where it's a clear, let's not do this. And there are those, you know, occasional ones that become tweeners and we wind up debating it and deciding what to do. But um, that's, you know, pretty much how we do it. And we do like to come back to our values and really check against, you know, what have we done historically on this? Um, and, and, you know, I do use this benchmark of how will history judge us on this? Were we on the right side of history? Mm -hmm. and, and that's actually one of the cool things about, I'm just looking at my watch here. That's one of the cool things about this company is, you know, as I look back on the company's history, the company has always had this, this track record of being on the right side of history. Um, one of the stories I love to tell is back in the 19, early 1990s, the Boy Scouts banned gay troop leaders. The company pulled all funding from the Boy Scouts and took a very strong stand, you know, because of our position on LGBTQ equality. And um, over the next week, this was still largely snail mail, the company had got over 100,000 letters and emails saying, I'm never buying Levi's again. I'm boycotting Levi's, never buying Levi's again. 
um, 98% of the letters were opposed to the stand that the company took. Now we look back at that and go like, oh my God, was that a no brainer or what? You know, the Boy Scouts have dropped boy um, from the name. They're struggling to stay alive right now. And they've, you know, they, they allowed um, gay troop leaders quite some time ago now. So history was clearly on our side there, you know, or we were on the right side of history. And, and that really is part of the bar that I set for these, these different, you know, issues that we decide to weigh in on. So I hope that answered your question. Sarah. Yeah, thank you so much. Sure. Well, I'm uh, Robert Strand and I have the, the privilege to be the executive director of the Center for Responsible Business and CHIP on behalf of all of us. It's just such a pleasure and privilege to have you. Um, and it, you mentioned uh, Levi's being around an institution, 1853, I believe, and, and, and we are so pleased that Levi's has been a strong partner of this fine institution, the University of California, Berkeley, 1868. So we've got 151 years under our belt, and Levi's has been a partner for a long time. And of course, the Haas School of Business, it's in our name. And the Center for Responsible Business, where, where I'm at, um, you've been our longest partner. And I want to thank you very much for your partnership, Chip, and Anna Walker, our fine CRB Senior Advisory Board member. Um, and of course, you're, you're talking with many of our fine students here at the Center for Responsible Business. So I have the privilege then to draw some questions from the audience that have come in and, and posed to you, Chip. Are you ready? Let's go. All right. Uh, question coming in here, uh, what are some ways that Levi's has taken care of its workers at the bottom of the supply chain, specifically in factories in Asia? Has COVID-19 pushed you to rethink the global supply chain model? So um, it's, it's a really good question. Um, most of the factories that make our product are third-party factories. We don't own them. We do, we do still have two factories. Um, one in Poland and one in South Africa. The one in South Africa is there because of import um, duties, making it impossible to import product in there. And there just isn't a quality third party manufacturer there. So we do have um, employees who work in apparel factories in our two factories, but then most of our, most of our supply chain is with third party manufacturers. And, um, you know, we've been very, very focused on um, the welfare, I would call it, of the, the apparel industry workers. And um, we have a program called Worker Wellbeing, which was started um, just before I joined the company. We, we started piloting in five countries, in five different suppliers, uh, developing programs with an unlikely marriage of NGOs on the ground, factory owners, and us kind of mediating. But the whole focus was in trying to understand what are the burning needs or burning issues of the mostly women, mostly young women who work in the apparel factories, cutting and sewing our product. And and what, one of the things we learned is that the issues varied from one country to another. In, in one country, it might be women's health. In another country, it might be childcare. In another country, it might be financial literacy. And um, we tested this program to try to demonstrate that if factory owners invested in their employees, just like we invest in our employees on a global basis, that there's a positive return on investment there for them. And um, so, because the only way we're going to get third party factory owners to invest in their, um, their you know, the, the, the people making our product uh, is to prove that there's a business case. And so fast forward now about 85 plus percent of our factories have this worker well-being program in place. We've worked with the Harvard School of Public Health to kind of validate the business uh, case, if you will, um, and have convinced all of our key strategic suppliers that they should be investing in their factory workers. And, um, and, and you, could, you could say, well, how does, that, how does the math actually work on that? Because obviously they got to invest real money in it. But if you think about it, I don't know how many people have actually seen an apparel factory, but 
in a big factory, you might have something the size of a, a football field or more. And it's basically an assembly line where the product is getting passed from station to station and every worker has a specific function that they do. They might be installing the rivets on the 501. They might be um, sewing the pant legs together. So each person has a very specific job to do and it is like, a fa uh, like an assembly line. Well, if, if a woman has childcare issues and she can't go to work, all of a sudden that station is empty. And that's a problem if you're a factory owner and 20% of your employees don't show up someday. And so just by getting greater continuity, less turnover, less absenteeism, these investments pay off and, um, and pay out for the factory owners. So, so we have invested there. COVID has had an impact on the supply chain. And one of the things that we did through the Levi Strauss Foundation is we invested a million dollars with our key strategic suppliers to help in those communities that were most impacted by COVID, to, to help those employees out in those communities most impacted by COVID. And now we're starting to see a second wave, as everybody knows. Um, and you know, we're, we're waiting to kind of understand the impact of that. So there was kind of the health impact of COVID. But the other thing that happened, you know, I talked about our stores were closed for 10 or 13 weeks in the second quarter, and our business is still down versus a year ago. The same thing's happening across the entire apparel industry. And people are like stopping orders. We were very, very clear right from the very beginning. If we placed an order with you and you, Mr. Factory Owner or Miss Factory Owner, have started making that product, we will pay you for that product. Okay, if it's an order where no work has started, we want to suspend that order. We'll come back to it when business resumes, but we will pay you for everything that you've committed to and um, trying to keep our suppliers whole. The last thing that we've done is uh, we've worked with a couple of international financing organizations, so the IFC uh, and others, to um, provide low cost capital to factory owners so that they can invest in these kind of programs, they can invest in sustainability initiatives to, to be continuing down the path of doing the right thing. And, um, you know, and that's one more way to support these businesses um, and it's not out of our pocket, it's just by hooking them up with the right kind of vehicles so that they have access to low cost financing. That's great, Chip, thank you so much. And uh, with respect to sustainability, we're getting a number of questions that are coming in along the lines of sustainability. And we have just a little over five minutes uh, left here. So um, one of the questions that came in, uh, considering the fact that both fashion and retail accelerate climate change, how have you found balance between achieving high profit margins while also maintaining advocacy towards sustainability? Yeah, so um, you know, let's let's be straight. Um, you know, uh, the apparel industry is a bad guy when it comes to planet Earth right now. Not helped by the fact that consumers have been bad guys too. Um, you know, we have lived in an age. All of us who are on this call right now have lived in an age of uh, conspicuous consumption, um, and I think the pandemic has shined a spotlight on that. People are starting to realize. I think the days of conspicuous consumption are gone people are starting to realize the impact of our conspicuous consumption, the impact that it's having on planet earth. You know, the pictures of the pollution over Beijing and the blue sky over Beijing side by side, you know, pre-lockdown, post-lockdown, the pictures of uh, Delhi in India, the famous gate in Delhi, pre-pandemic, post-lockdown. Pre-pandemic, you can barely see the car in front of you, the smog is so bad. Post-pandemic, you see blue sky. And you can see a couple of hundred yards. People are realizing the damage that we as humans are having on planet Earth. And so um, I do think sustainability is going to go from being a backseat issue for a lot of people to really front and center. For young people, for Gen Z, it's right at the top of the list. And in fact, one of the programs that we just launched uh, a couple of weeks ago taps into this insight of uh, consumers wanting to participate in a circular economy. 
we have arguably the number one brand in thrift stores, right? We're the, we're the number one brand in flea markets. People go to flea markets and thrift stores looking for vintage Levi's. And, you know, there's no data to back that up. So you're just going to have to take me at my word. But I, I feel pretty confident saying there's no brand that is bigger in thrift than Levi's. And, um, and so we decided we're going to participate in this upcycling, this recycling. So we just launched a website called uh, Levi'sSecondHand.com. And uh, the way it works is if you've got an old pair of Levi, if you put on COVID-15, I've got a solution for you. Take your old Levi's to a Levi's store, and we will give you somewhere in the range of five to $25, depending on what those Levi's are. And we will take them from you. We'll give you a gift certificate or a store coupon for somewhere between five and $25, depending on what you bring in. You can go buy yourself a new pair. We take the old pair, we're working with a third party. We, they clean it, they repair it if it needs repair, then we post it on this website and we sell it. And it's a great value. And, um, and, and it's good for planet earth. It's good for the consumer. It's a great value, as I said. It also drives traffic to our stores. And so it's a win, 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 win all the way around, no matter how you look at it. And so this is a big opportunity. Um, so I, I kind of got a little bit off track there, but, but you know, at the end of the day, we're very, very committed on making a difference in the apparel supply chain, whether it's more sustainable chemistry, we've, we've introduced, we've got this proprietary technology that's got lots of IP around it where we're finishing our genes, which used to require thousands of chemicals, we finish them on a laser. And, and it requires less than 10 chemicals. And we recycle the water so clear that I have drank the recycled water. So it, it's, you know, we continue to innovate in this area and we're leading. And in areas where it's not like a competitive advantage, we open source it. So our screen chemistry program, we open source it. Our waterless program, we open source it. We'll give it to anybody. Our, our worker well-being program that I talked about, we open source it. So, um, you know, it's not something we're going to build a competitive advantage around. It's just doing the right thing. And the more people that do it, the better off we're all going to be. I love that, Chip. And I think it really speaks to one might ask, you know, how do you innovate a pair of jeans? There was the rivet so many years ago. That was an innovation. And what you're speaking to here, Chip, are so many innovations that many of us on the consumer side of things aren't even aware of, but as well as you're innovating new business models, these right. new business models for circularity. And that's what we need. When we want to reimagine capitalism, we need to reimagine how we do business at the very core. So um, let me give you one more plug. I know we're almost out of time, but please. one other program that we're that we launched this season right now, you can find it in stores. So cotton is a bad guy too. Okay. Cotton, you know, we're basically a cotton made product. Um, and now a lot of our product has stretch in it, but we use a lot of cotton. Cotton uses a lot of water and it takes a lot of land. Um, we've worked with a supplier. We've got a proprietary position in this that um, takes hemp, which if anybody has felt a hemp fabric before, it feels like burlap. It's a very fibrousy fiber. We've worked with the supplier who has developed a, a, a technique or a technology to soften hemp so that it's as soft as cotton. And when we blend it with real cotton, hemp doesn't require nearly as much, hemp is a weed, it is weed. Um, and, and, and it requires a lot less land, it requires a lot less water, and we're now selling a, an entire line of products with this cottonized hemp in it. It's a win-win. The consumer can't even tell the difference versus something that's 100% cotton. And over time, as the scales, it'll be cheaper than cotton and, uh, and, it, and it's good for planet Earth. And I'm convinced it's good for the consumer. It's, it's good all the way. It's a win, 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 win all the way around. Well, that's a, a great uh, example there, Chip. And, and just a, a further example of the leadership role that Levi's is playing. And, and also, I, I'd like to... I'll be, I'm bringing this to a close here now, but before I do, I want to commend you and thank you very much 
Chip, for the leadership role that you're taking in policy advocacy on issues that matter. And when we talk about addressing those structural inequities, racial injustices, threats to our democratic institution and way of life, we need policy champions. And Chip, you're leveraging your platform and Levi's, the platform of Levi's, and on behalf of all of us, thank you so very much. So this brings us to a close here on behalf of Dean Harrison and the Berkeley Haas Center for Responsible Business. I'd like to thank our student leaders, Nicole, Justin, Sarah, and Olivia for your compelling questions and your engagement today. And a sincere UC Berkeley thanks to you, Chip, for taking the time to join us today for this joint Rudolph Peterson and Berkeley Haas Dean's speaker series. Your personal commitment to Levi Strauss values-driven leadership is a wonderful example of our Berkeley Haas defining leadership principles, how they can be brought to life in redefining business for a sustainable and equitable future. And with that, our event has come to an end. So thank you all so very much for joining us and we hope that you have a safe and happy holiday season ahead. Goodbye everyone. <laughs>